good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Some of you already know me. Uh, my name is Herman Jali Ng. I was previously here uh, a group leader uh, for the uh, for the millimeter wave wireless group um, um, that belongs to the security design department. Uh, previously, my group uh, worked on um, yeah very fancy things uh, like scalable uh, radar transceivers at very very high frequency at 120 gigahertz, 240 gigahertz. But today. Um, I would like to talk about more, um, yeah, not so fancy stuff at much lower frequency. Um, I left IHP uh, three years ago to uh, to replace my old professor at the Hochschule Karlsruhe. Uh, he has uh, since retired. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about um, one of our work uh, um, um, on on the topic of operational amplifier that can be used for uh, HPGE. Um, radiation detectors. So um, this is the outline of my talk. Um, in the introduction, I will present the system application uh, of the so-called HPGE detector that can, be, um, that can be used for the, um, for the detection of radiation. Um, we will see that uh, this detector needs um, um, very um, accurate front-end electronics. Um, uh, after that, I will talk about uh, the design challenges um, in, in modern CMOS technology nodes. Um, I will uh, show you um, some of our proposed uh, secret architectures and um, um, show you also some simulation results. And then I will um, talk about our typical design concepts and what we are using um, uh, for the, for the uh, chip design. And then... Um, this is an add-on. I will also show, uh, show you some of uh, our current uh, funded projects and uh, the teams that are working in the project. And then um, I will end my talk with a short summary. So uh, we recently started a cooperation with a research team in Max Planck Institute for um, Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg, uh, who is conducting research on uh, semiconductor-based um, radiation detectors. Um, that can be also used for the, um, for the fundamental research of um, elementary particle physics. Uh, these are some examples, some examples of the um, detectors and some of the measurement set setups. Currently, the so-called high-purity germanium or HPGE detectors are the state-of-the-art um, and are able also to achieve the highest dynamic range. Uh, that's why uh, uh, these uh, HPG detectors are used in uh, many different applications, including uh, environmental monitoring for radioactive, uh, radioactive uh, contamination, medical application, space research and exploration, and of course also in the, uh, in the fundamental research of uh, yeah, uh, elementary particles of physics. Yeah. Back in. Um, the work principle of the detector is actually quite simple. If, um, if we have an interaction between the um, elementary particles and the semiconductor detector, um, free charge carrier or electron hole pairs uh, will be created. But we also know that um, in the semiconductor detector, the electron hole pairs can also be generated by other means of uh, energy, uh, like heat and light. Um, that's why in a typical setup uh, in this HPGE detector, this is usually submerged in, um, in a liquid nitrogen uh, cryostat that is cooled um, at a constant temperature of minus 180 degrees Celsius. Yeah? Uh, this is also here the setup for the, for the germanium uh, detector array um, in, uh, in an underground laboratory uh, somewhere in Italy. Um, you see here the detector arrays um, that is also cooled uh, um, in a liquid argon cryostat and put in a water tank and then shield it from <clears throat> all, um, all interferences that can occur in, um, in the lab. Yeah, so uh, I'm not going too much into details because I'm also not a, a PCC. Uh, um, I would rather concentrate on the front end electronics. So, 
Yeah, um, we know for the material, if we have uh, metal, uh, we have too many um, free uh, charge carrier in the metal. On the other side, an insulator, we need a huge energy to uh, generate the, uh, the electron hole pass. Yeah, so both materials are not suitable. Semiconductor is um, our best bet. Um, semiconductors uh, also, of course, has a free charge carrier. Uh, in order to use the, the material as a radiation detector, we have to free it from uh, any excess charges. This can be done uh, easily, uh, usually as a um, depletion region that uh, we know um, uh, is established if we combine P-dope and N-dope um, semiconductor materials. Yeah, we know that at the transition, the holes will diffuse from the P-dope semiconductor into N-dope semiconductor, and the electrons will also diffuse from N to the P-dope uh, semiconductors, leaving behind bound bonded charges. Yeah, so uh, we have, uh, as a result, a depletion region. Um, an electric field is also built uh, in the depletion region. Yeah, so we have here in the depletion region practically no free charge carrier. Yeah, so the idea is quite simple. Uh, we can even extend this depletion region by applying a uh, very high voltage uh, between the two electrodes. Yeah, the very high voltage in the reverse direction. Yeah? So typically, uh, a voltage of up to 5,000 volt is applied. Um, I will not go, like I said, not too much into the details. Um, this is how usually how it is implemented. Uh, the, the detector actually more or less look like a cylinder with a cavity in the middle. Uh, I'm not sure why, why this is done like this. <laughs> but at the end, the idea is um, if we have the depletion region and there is an interaction between the elementary particles with the semiconductor, uh, semiconductor materials, then we get the free charge carrier. And this free charge carrier will drift in the electric field in the depletion region and move towards the electrodes. Yeah, the, um, the charge preamplifier should then collect the generated charges in the integrator and convert it into a voltage signal. That's the whole idea. <clears throat> oh. I see. Okay. Maybe now again. Just back. Yeah, okay. Great. So, uh, the front end electronics have a task uh, have, uh, um, to collect the generated charges um, and convert them into uh, useful information. Uh, usually, um, the, the design goal should be always to achieve the highest dynamic range. Yeah, this is usually uh, implemented like this, that the charge amplifier is um, complemented with a variable gain amplifier to optimize the uh, the dynamic range of the whole system before the signal gets uh, converted into um, into digital by the AD converter. Yeah, the thing is that the charge preamplifier has to be uh, to be uh, placed very close uh, to the uh, HPGE detector. Uh, there should be no uh, long connection between the detector and the charge preamplifier because all the metal uh, connection also can uh, falsify the radiation information. Yeah, so they have to be placed close together, and ideally, the charge preamplifier can also not be implemented using uh, discrete components on a PCB because also on a PCB we we have a large amount of copper which can also falsify the radiation information. So ideally, the charge preamplifier has to be implemented on chip. Yeah, so um, the small amount of the chips will uh, be certainly not really falsify the radiation information. That's the whole story. Um, of course, now that if the charge preamplifier is implemented on chip, then, um, then we can also implement um, everything on, on a single chip, yeah? including the variable gain amplifier and also the AD converter. The idea of the charge preamplifier is, uh, is actually quite simple. The, the charge generated by the detector um, should be integrated, so we make use of an integrator in combination with a uh, um, operational amplifier. We know that due to the large uh, open loop gain of the operational amplifier and the high ohmic uh, input impedance of the uh, operational amplifier, 
the input signal will always stay uh, zero. So ideally it should be zero so that the charge generated by the detector will be uh, will directly flow into the feedback capacitor and uh, the charge preamplifier will output the signal as a voltage. Um, and then um, afterwards, uh, this output signal can uh, still be amplified further using the uh, differential voltage amplifier to match uh, the output swing to the maximum uh, input range of the AD converter. So the, the idea is to really achieve the highest dynamic range as, as high as possible. Yeah? This, is, this is done really in several stages. Um, now uh, we are thinking to implement everything into, into one single chip. To make it more interesting, then we, uh, we also um, decide to, um, to, uh, to put the same AD converter on the same chip. Uh, the AD converter, we would like to uh, utilize the oversampling technique and the noise, shap uh, noise shaping technique that, uh, that are enabled by the Delta Sigma modulator uh, to, uh, to, to achieve the highest dynamic range. Um, I will not go too much into details. I know that uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of a Delta Sigma modulator based AD converter. Why not choose the SAR ADC? This is a long story. Uh, the short story is because um, the experience in Delta Sigma modulator is there. So I know how to, um, uh, to implement that. And for the SAR ADC, we need um, additional um, literature research. Yeah, so the oversampling technique, I think I, I don't want to go too much detail. Uh, the idea is quite simple. Uh, in a conventional Nyquist sampler, the quantization noise here is concentrated uh, here uh, in the frequency range uh, between zero and, uh, and the bandwidth of the signal. The idea of the oversampling is to spread this quantization noise uh, into a much higher uh, frequency range so that in, in total uh, the power is actually much lower. And then using the noise shaping technique, the quantization noise is also then shifted to the higher frequency so that at the end, um, the signal after a uh, uh, simple uh, uh, low-pass filter can be freed from, um, um, from the quantization noise yeah, as much as possible. Uh, the, the very simple uh, Delta Sigma modulator can be also implemented fully differentially to, make, um, uh, to optimize the dynamic range of, um, um, of the charge amplifier. Okay, now we go through um, um, to the design challenges in modern CMOS technology. As we know, <clears throat> um, in, um, in modern um, technology nodes, uh, let's say below 180 nanometer, the channel length modulation uh, is quite high, so it, it is in the range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 per volt, so it means um, um, more or less uh, if we want to use a transistor as an ideal current source, we won't have it, so we will have a very huge uh, output resistance. Uh, the output resistance is not really uh, really high ohmic. Typically, we get an output resistance in the range of 10 kilo ohm to 50 kilo ohm. Yeah. So if we want to use the transistor uh, as, let's say, as an active load uh, in an um, in an amplifier, we can typically achieve an amplification or a gain of 5 to 75. Not really that much. So. Um, this is, this is due to the channel length modulation. You can, of course, play a little bit with the, chan, uh, with, the, with the length of the transistor, but you can probably not optimize the gain by that much. That's why um, in a typical design, you need the Casco technique yeah, to, uh, to boost the gain. Um, on the other side, we also know in the, um, in the modern CMOS technology nodes, um, the breakdown voltage become smaller and smaller so at, um, at IHP technology, for example, uh, 130 nanometer, uh, CMOS, the, the, the minimal breakdown voltage is in the range of 2 volts. So typically, uh, the, the digital circuits uh, is usually supplied with, uh, with, a, uh, with a supply voltage of 1.2 to 1.5. Yeah, let's say if we, if we supply our circuit with 1.5 volt, we cannot really simply use the cascode and stack many transistors uh, to, um, to boost the, the output resistance of the transistor. Yeah? Uh, because then we get, as a result, a very nice uh, uh, current mirror, but the output swing um, is completely useless. We get completely very low um, uh, output swing, and 
we cannot really um, use the amplifier as it is. So that's why uh, if we need uh, the casco technique, then um, we have to apply the low voltage uh, casco technique and combine it with the folded casco technique. Yeah? So in this way, if we do that, uh, we can boost the amplification uh, factor uh, to, uh, to something between 250 and 1,000. So the thing is that uh, because if we, do the, if we do the folded cast code, uh, even if we uh, apply the low voltage folded cast code, we still have uh, quite low uh, output swing. Yeah? Typically, we lose here the, um, the output swing of four times the overdrive voltage of, uh, of the transistors if we really apply the, 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 voltage, uh, the low voltage cast code um, uh, correctly. Yeah? And, um, and the output is also quite high ohmic. That's why it is, um, it is usually not used as an output stage. Typically, we should, um, we should combine it um, with an additional or with a second stage uh, push-pull common source amplifier. Uh, this is then used as an output stage. Uh, and if we do that, we can, again, of course, increase the gain by, uh, by 10 to 150, and we get a much lower output resistance. Um, and in total, then, um, our uh, operational amplifier acts more like a, an ideal operational amplifier. And then uh, we, uh, uh, we also get a rail-to-rail -rail output swing and a very high slow rate. So this is then how it looks like um, the high-gain operation amplifier with single-ended rail-to-rail output. <clears throat> the differential stage uh, with the folded cast code and then uh, here for the uh, for the push-pull output, common source circuit to work uh, properly, you also need to provide some biasing. This is done here with a, with a so-called quasi-current um, mirror. We uh, additionally add two parallel transistors in the folded cast code uh, stage uh, to, to provide the biasing uh, for the output stage, for the, uh, the push-pull stage. Uh, the single-ended output uh, is then also modified for the second version because we need, uh, in the second stage uh, of the charge amplifier, a voltage, a real fully differential voltage amplifier with differential output so that uh, we simply use the same uh, circuit, optimize it, and extend it with a second output. Yeah, the same push-pull common source at the second output, but uh, then here uh, you need uh, another additional circuitry, which is the common mode feedback. Yeah, so you need to somehow also make sure that um, the DC output voltage is, um, is somehow regulated uh, to a certain voltage. This can, this can be done using the common mode feedback um, amplifier. Uh, you can even uh, decide what kind of DC voltage that you would like to have here. This is here the, the input for the common mode feedback. So you can see here some of the simulation results. Uh, this, is, uh, this is for the uh, single-ended uh, operational amplifier. We can typically get uh, something around uh, the maximum um, open-loop gain uh, is somewhere in the range of 85 dB. This is, of course, not really optimized yet. Uh, I think with a small optim optim optimization, we can achieve something around 100 dB as an open-loop gain. Uh, transit frequency is in the range of 70 megahertz. The phase margin is, um, uh, should be always larger than uh, 60 degrees so that um, yeah, we can always guarantee the stability of our amplifier. Yeah, so this is just to show that uh, the, uh, the amplifier has a really uh, range to range, uh, rail to rail output. Um, uh, if you uh, put the amplifier in an inverting amplifier by combining it with two uh, resistors, uh, then you can um, uh, hear, for example, uh, for the configuration of uh, amplification factor of 10, so 100 kilo ohm and 10 kilo ohm as um, for the resistor, then you get you get a gain of uh, minus 10 or in dB 20 dB. Then you get something um, uh, for the output. Uh, if you um, uh, if you want to check uh, uh, the, uh, the the output swing, you get something um, for the 1 dB output revert peak to peak output voltage is uh, 1.5 volt. If you supply the operation amplifier with uh, uh, with also 1.5 volt uh, supply voltage. Yeah. So the, here in example, I supply the operation, uh, we supply the operation amplifier with um, plus minus 0 0.75 volt. So the goal is actually achieved. Yeah. This is the summary. Uh, it is still 
work ongoing. We have not done everything yet. We have not done. Uh, we have not optimized everything yet. Even the layout is half finished, so that's why I could not include the layout yet. Um, I also want to show you what what kind of tools that uh, we have used in the past. Um, here, um, the gain 85 dB, the, uh, the transit frequency 70 megahertz. Uh, we have also an offset, DC offset of uh, less than one millivolt, which is of course really nice, but I think it still can be optimized a little bit. Uh, the slew rate is quite high. We get something around 25 volt pro uh, microsecond. And as for the operational amplifier, the die area should be smaller than uh, 0 0.25 square millimeters. So I think it should be not a problem. Um, uh, I hope to get the chip area from you guys. Uh, if, uh, if it is supplied uh, with a 1.5 volt supply voltage, the current consumption should be um, around 1 milliamps. So the power consumption is really low. So uh, for the design concept and tools, we, um, because, um, uh, we choose this topic because it is uh, also a topic that, I, uh, uh, that, that fits quite well with my teaching. Uh, I teach uh, uh, CMOS analog uh, integrated circuits. It fits quite well. We, uh, we develop most of the stuff actually by uh, using hand analysis. So uh, that's why uh, it is really important for us that the models, um, are really simple models, uh, 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 can be created. For now, uh, we, uh, we mainly actually created the models by ourselves for the, for the hand analysis. Yeah? So, you know, for the spectra um, uh, simulation, uh, the current state of the art um, um, is the PSP models. This is one level higher than the BSIM uh, model. Uh, this is really, uh, for the hand analysis, not really useful. Yeah? So, uh, we need a really simple models that can give us the information like what is really the transconductance parameter of the transistor? How can we scale the transconductance parameter with the width and the length ratio? What is the channel length modulation? Something like that. This is done currently um, uh, uh, by hand. Yeah? So we, we try to, uh, to extract it by, uh, by, uh, by the spectra simulation and then using um, our, uh, our own tools, uh, we generate a very simple um, level one model, Schickman Hodge models, I think you know um, this year. Uh, we also rely much uh, the cadence fit also, but this is also a problem that, uh, that is mostly fed by the industry. We will talk about it later. But uh, we also use NG Spice and KiCad um, for uh, most of our project with the students. We have no tool, re uh, tool preference uh, for, those, uh, for, uh, for the stuff that we have done here. Actually, this can be actually done very easily using the open source tools like the NG Spice. We do not really require any. Um, as parameter simulation, we simply uh, need uh, a simple AC simulation, transient simulation, DC simulation, that's it. Yeah, the thing is that, uh, you know, also uh, the NG SPICE, the, the standard SPICE syntax doesn't allow um, parameter switch. This is something that probably has to be addressed in the future, how we can do parameter switch in SPICE simulation. Yeah. This uh, can also be done, of course, by hand, by just simply doing several simulations, but I think um, uh, this should be done uh, much better uh, in the tools. Yeah. Uh, the SPICE syntax doesn't allow us to, uh, to do this parameter switch. Yeah, additionally, this is probably something that I might need help from IHP. I have several running projects uh, uh, also at higher frequency at 24 gigahertz. This is one of our projects uh, unfortunately, really low funding of 165 kilo, uh, thousand euros, and uh, the project uh, duration is is up to 2024. I have one employee uh, working on that project, but uh, I or we promised too much in the project. Currently, we have some funding issue uh, to implement the uh, the complete radar. The idea is to use the radar uh, uh, to um, uh, as a uh, skin detect, uh, um, skin cancer detector. Yeah? So this is uh, um, this is something that can be done uh, very easily by using the radar chips that I previously implemented also at IHP. I might probably ask for help here uh, to implement the chips here in the future. Uh, this is another project um, that uh, that is also running uh, at um, at the Hochschule, um, but yeah, due to the time, I cannot really explain. This is the team that is uh, currently working. Uh, in my group, uh, I have two permanent uh, employees uh, and then several students uh, 
mostly funded by the faculty um, as, uh, yeah, as assistant. Um, and as a summary, uh, the, yeah, the modern CMOS technology nodes uh, pose uh, many design challenges that have to be, um, to be solved by using novel circuit techniques, but most of this stuff can be solved really easily. Uh, we choose a very simple uh, uh, project um, as, a, as a test uh, to, to try something um, with the open source PDK. I hope that um, this is something that is suitable also for the, for the open PDK because this is a very basic building blocks operational amplifier. You do not need any additional simulation. The NG spice is, uh, is good enough uh, and even K layout for the layout is, um, is, is good as, as it is, yeah? And um, I think that um, we can really actually uh, try it with the, with the open PDK. Um, yeah, that's from my side.